this, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, cooperation and collaboration between, not only within government, but between government and the private sector. So, so, so before we start, uh, just, a, just a comment. You, you, you're hearing a lot about public sector collaboration, federal, state, local, municipal. When you deal with the private sector, it's like herding cats. When you, when you try to deal with getting the private sector writ large involved in collaboration and cooperation issues, it brings up a whole host of issues. And hopefully we'll surface some of those issues as it pertains to, to planning, preparedness, maybe we'll get into a little bit of uh, prevention, mitigation, response, and recovery as it pertains to the uh, integration of private and public sector. But uh, just, just briefly, the, the, the way that I want to do this will be similar to the other panel, but I want to hear from the public sector first. So uh, um, I'm going to start off with Mary Ann, then I'm going to go to James Cho from the city of New York, then I'm going to end up with the, what I consider to be the private sector presentation by, by Lori Hennon Bell. I've asked them to uh, speak for the same, the same format as the previous panel. Talk for about 15 or so odd minutes, each one. Then what we'll do is have a discussion amongst the panelists themselves and we'll open it up for discussion. So what I'd like to do at this time is, is uh, start off with uh, Mary Ann Tierney, the Deputy Managing Director for Emergency Management, City of Philadelphia. Mary Ann. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to thank uh, Richard Keevey for having me here today. Uh, I was asked to speak uh, in particular about how uh, the public sector emergency management uh, can interface with the private sector. Um, I know that a lot of this, uh, a lot of the discussion has been about partnerships, but I want to frame this, uh, this discussion in, in terms of integration. I think partnership is, is a misnomer when it comes to involving the private sector or really any non-governmental organization in, in government activities. Generally, people in government, when they talk about partnership, it means what I can do with your money and resources, and not so much on the other side. Uh, so integration, I think, is a, is, a, is, a, is a more robust description of what you want to try to achieve with the private sector in terms of uh, preparing and responding and recovering from, from large disasters. I'm going to start off uh, by telling you a little bit about Philadelphia, and just for those folks that may not know about uh, our little city uh, just to the south of here. I'm going to talk a little about the Office of Emergency Management, and then I'm going to uh, discuss kind of how we integrate the private sector into our work in emergency preparedness in Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia, uh, as you may know, is the sixth largest city in the country, has a population of about 1.4 million people. Uh, we are strategically located uh, right between uh, New York and Washington, D.C., which makes us a very, I think, desirable target uh, for terrorists as New York City and Washington become more hardened. I think uh, the opportunity to strike an East Coast city like Philadelphia, which has a, a very good strategic location, a lot of critical infrastructure, ranging from one of the nation's largest oil refineries uh, right down to our a very critical Tasty Cake factory, which if you ask any Philadelphian is essential to their daily diet. <laughs> uh, so we have a very... Uh, broad range of critical infrastructure in Philadelphia. We have a very diverse population. Uh, we're a very, uh, in some cases you would uh, say Philadelphia is a very poor urban area. A uh, one in four Philadelphians live below the poverty level. That's a very high uh, rate of poverty for a city that large. Uh, Pew Charitable Trust uh, actually on Monday released a very comprehensive analysis of kind of the demographics and economy of the city. So if you're particularly interested in learning more about that, I would suggest you, you take a look at that study. You can get that from their website. Um, so in, in this urban environment where you have a lot of different types of economies, you have a very diverse demographic profile, um, and uh, you have a very large public safety operation, that's kind of where we fit in the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, the office has kind of been reborn since 2006. We've been focusing a lot on uh, developing operational plans, uh, conducting training and exercises for all of the different stakeholders that are involved in preparedness, and, and had a very large focus on educating the public through a variety of different channels, uh, traditional media and more emerging uh, technologies as well. Um, we do a lot of work with the private sector at the Office of Emergency Management in, in Philadelphia. We focus uh, really in two areas, uh, trying to integrate the private sector. The first one uh, I would refer to as kind of the planning, training, responding 
uh, you know, vein. And then the second is about capacity building and, and designing tools to develop resiliency among uh, the private sector organizations in the city. So in the area of planning, uh, a couple things that I'll, I'll touch on is, um, first of all, how do you integrate the private sector into planning? And, so, and this is kind of taking that word partnership and, and kind of moving it a little further down uh, the spectrum. In terms of integration, uh, for me, when it comes to planning, that means that the private sector isn't just somebody that you go and brief your plan to. The private sector is at the table developing the plan with you. In some cases, setting the priorities on what plan should be developed. Uh, the example that I would draw on here is how we've developed our evacuation plan for the, for the city. Uh, over the past two years, we've worked very hard to develop a, a comprehensive evacuation plan for the city, the basis of which started uh, with identifying routes, uh, evacuation routes within the city and evacuation zones, which, which had not been done previously. Uh, that was done um, through a, a multi-agency task force. There's about 25 different organizations, both from the public sector at all levels of government, uh, down to the nonprofit sector, and then through the private sector. And in many cases, we relied on the private sector to give us a gauge of how would the public react to these routes? You know, what would work for their business environment? How do we integrate different parts of the city's road and mass transit system into this to accommodate both the needs of commuters that come into the city on a daily basis as well as the residents that live, work, and, and play in Philadelphia? From the development of those routes, we uh, have taken on uh, developing a series of uh, tactical plans for the city really focused around cre uh, key critical infrastructure sites, areas where uh, an evacuation is, is highly likely or where there's a hazard profile that's very high that may necessitate an evacuation. <laughs> and so we've been working with the private sector to develop tactical plans on how to actually implement the routes that were designed by this multi-agency task force. Uh, two uh, projects in the development of these plans that I'll talk about is identifying rallying points for high-rise office buildings in our center, center business district, uh, which is Center City, and then the University City District, which is just across the river from, from Center City. Um, previously, I guess anecdotally, there was a lot of discussion about how uh, high-rise office building tenants, occupants, and businesses made decisions about where to evacuate their employees in, in an emergency. And, uh, I guess people tend to go where it's most convenient and close and, and where everybody would generally kind of know where to go. And so the daytime population of Center City seemed to be evacuating uh, to four places. And that's about 300,000 people in four places. And that doesn't seem to logically work very well because you couldn't fit all those people in those four places. So we worked very closely with property managers, building owners, uh, public safety agencies, and uh, kind of advocacy, different advocacy groups for the private sector and identifying and centralizing the selection of these rallying points for businesses. And we developed a scheme where, depending on your building location, you evacuated to one of 14 rallying points throughout Center City. Uh, and this was done to accommodate the large number of people, this 300,000 number at any day that, uh, during the business day that could be in Center City in a way that made sense and was, you know, you got the economies of scale and the efficiencies of having a centralized uh, decision-making process for that. Uh, that was done, like I said, with the private sector at the table actually assisting us in making the decisions about how to develop that system. So rather than government kind of imposing a system or coming with a straw, a straw man document, we actually started from scratch and said, you know, we are not, you know, going to say that we're the experts at this, but how can we work together to find a solution that works best for both sides? We then replicated that planning process in the University City District in Philadelphia, which uh, was uh, somewhat more complicated because we have two very large universities over there, Penn and Drexel. And then we have four hospitals that kind of are in a three block radius of each other. And then all of these uh, high rise buildings. And that project was actually uh, brought forth by a member of the private sector who indicated that they wanted that the community of private sector building uh, property managers in University City wanted a plan like existed for a center city district. And so in that case, the private sector drove the process by saying to government, we need to have a plan to do this as well over here because we have a very large number of high-rise buildings and we have a very complicated infrastructure in terms of health care and, and educational institutions. And this needs to be coordinated, just like it was coordinated on the other side of the river. And so we, we heard that and we took that priority and we completed a plan in December uh, of last year to, to accommodate that need by the private sector. And I think that's, if I, if I can draw on an example of what I mean by integration, 
that is, I think, a good example of how it's a, it's a push and pull relationship. It's not just government bringing something forth or having kind of a session where everybody gets together and talks, but then none of that information is ever actualized. Then in training and access, if I can move from planning to talk next about this other activity that we engage the private sector on is training and exercises. It's one thing to develop plans with the private sector uh, kind of at the table. It's another thing to train and exercise those plans with the private sector participants that will be affected by the plans implementation as well as first responders and other organizations that will actually have to execute the plan. And so we have uh, always uh, involved the private sector in our training and exercise activities so that they're training alongside the people that will be operating during an emergency. They're getting a more, a fuller understanding of their roles in that emergency. And then uh, during exercises, they're working to implement the plan that they helped write. And we've done this with, with the evacuation plans that we've developed. Now we've had uh, four exercises, uh, some developed solely by the private sector involving government agencies, and then some developed by my office involving the private sector. And through that partnership, we've been really able to leverage uh, lots of different resources to execute many exercises otherwise, that, that otherwise we would have not been able to do due to budgetary constraints. Um, our last exercise was written almost entirely by members of the private sector, um, and that was done uh, uh, free of charge for us by the very people that helped write the plan. And so that's the kind of work uh, I think that, is, that really resonates with in, involving the private sector in terms of training and exercises. The third area, kind of in that operational spectrum of planning, training, exercising, and then there's response, which is how do you integrate the private sector into your response operations? Because now you've been writing plans with them, you're training to the plans, you're practicing the plans, now you actually have to implement the plan. Well, how does the private sector fit into that? There's really two ways that they do. Uh, the first one is the on-scene kind of on-site coordination where they're integrated into the command post operation where they're with um, generally senior decision makers from fire and police assisting in, in making decisions and providing guidance on how those decisions that are made by first responders will, imp will affect their operation or how the decisions that they're making may or may not work given the constraints of whatever they're dealing with. Um, examples of that include when we have um, very rarely, thankfully, but when we have incidents that involve our refineries in Philadelphia, we have a joint command post with uh, operators from the refineries and then people from the fire department and the police department working jointly together to resolve those, those issues. On-site coordination is one piece. The other piece for larger citywide emergencies involves integration of the private sector into your emergency operations center. This is really essential. Lots of large cities are doing this more and more. Um, the federal government is starting to do it, and I know states are doing it as well. And I'm not uh, discussing specifically about having a separate facility for the private sector. I think to be truly integrated, they need to be kind of in the same facility, almost in the same room if you have space to accommodate it, as the public sector organizations. And what you can do, what a lot of organizations do uh, in the governmental side is, within the Emergency Operations Center, create an emergency support function for the private sector. And then invite in umbrella organizations that represent individual members of the private sector. So you can't have every high-rise building owner and property manager in your EOC if you're in a city like Philadelphia or like New York but you can have their umbrella organization, the Building Owners and Managers Association, at the table pushing information out and receiving information in about the impact of the emergency on those entities. You can also involve a special services districts. In Philadelphia, we have a couple of special services districts, one for our cent central business district as well as one for our sports complex. We routine routinely involve them in our emergency operations center activations. Most recently, when the Phillies uh, won the World Series, uh, we had our emergency operations center open for that, for the victory celebration after the win, as well as for the parade uh, two days later. And we had a very robust representation by uh, representatives from the private sector, both in South Philadelphia by the uh, sports complex, as well as in Center City, where a lot of businesses were impacted along the parade route. So that kind of gives you the, I guess, the trifecta of how to integrate the private sector into this operational side of emergency preparedness. Um, in terms of what other things government should be doing to integrate the private sector, it uh, really focuses on building capacity and resiliency in the private sector to recover from emergencies. Now, a lot of governments, local governments, 
rely heavily on private sector taxes to operate their government. And so it's, it's of an economic necessity to ensure that the private sector is prepared to respond to an emergency. That's this whole integration part I was talking about before. But also to quickly recover and resume business so that they can continue to generate revenue, which then will result in taxes. Um, so how we do that in Philadelphia is by providing tools to the private sector to help them recover. For the first thing that we have, uh, have done is we've developed a city-specific business continuity planning toolkit for, uh, for small to medium-sized businesses in Philadelphia. We focus on small to medium-sized businesses because most of our economic base are small to medium-sized businesses. Um, and most of the larger organizations have an infrastructure internal to their organization to support business continuity planning. So our focus is on the organizations that generally kind of get left behind in a large emergency. And we've developed a specific toolkit for them that focuses on the plans that we've created and their application in an emergency and how you can take best practices in terms of business continuity planning, marry that with the plans the city actually has so that you can develop a plan to respond and recover from an emergency if you're a small to medium sized business. In addition to that toolkit, we also provide regular workshops to educate people about the toolkit and walk them through how to develop a business continuity plan. Many businesses do not have the infrastructure to do this in-house. They can't hire specific business continuity planners. They don't have the resources to outsource that. And so this is a, a value-added service that we provide to assist businesses that may not necessarily do this kind of planning, uh, encouraging them to doing, do it by giving them the tools that they need to, to recover. We also have tools that allow people operationally to resume business uh, quicker. We have something in Philadelphia called the Corporate Emergency Access System. It's a pre-credentialing program for the private sector that allows them, uh, critical members of private sector organizations to be pre-designated by that organization with a credential that's authenticated and legitimate and then recognized by law enforcement. Uh, so that if there is a perimeter established, like you would, may have seen after 9-11, or most, most recently it was used in New York City after a steam explosion uh, the past summer, which maybe Jim Cho could talk about, um, where the private sector is then able to quickly enter perimeter areas that are secure but cordoned off for operational reasons, um, collect important documents, and then move to a hot site or resume their business in some other way. Um, then... Lastly, I just wanted to talk briefly about kind of the integration in terms of critical infrastructure. The previous panel spent a lot of time talking about critical infrastructure, so I'm not going to try to rehash all that. But I, just in terms of how, in my office, we've tried to integrate more with the private sector in terms of critical infrastructure protection. Uh, we uh, participate in all of the uh, site assessments that occur related to critical infrastructure that are done by the Department of Homeland Security. And then we use the results of those site assessments to advocate uh, for critical infrastructure uh, owners, whether it's a refinery or a chemical facility, for homeland security dollars. And so we take those assessments very seriously, and we look at those as a tool that we can use in advocating for resources or advocating for policy changes that may aid those critical infrastructure owners and operators to, more, to operate more effectively before and during an emergency, and ultimately, hopefully, to prevent any type of terrorist attack from occurring on that critical infrastructure. So I guess that, um, that probably wasn't entirely 15 minutes, but that, that concludes my remarks. And I guess when the panel's done, I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Marianne. Um, moving on, I'd like to uh, introduce James Cho, Director of Plan Management Unit, New York City Office of Emergency Management. James? Hi. Uh, thanks for letting me come back to my hometown. Uh, I grew up in Princeton, so it's, it's nice to be back here. Uh, even though it's only about maybe an hour and a half away by train. Um, and my mom was happy that I came over dinner last night. So, <laughs> so I think she's, she has good feelings towards everybody here. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about probably about three things here. One is sort of to give an idea, give everyone here an idea as to where my perspective is, where I'm coming from when it comes to planning. Because that's, that's what I do at, at New York City OEM. Is I, I work on plans and I think of, we work with a group of people that think of the concepts and, and write these documents that help guide sort of um, events or response to events. Um, the next thing is sort of talk about a little bit what, what's happening in New York City at the local level and how that, how that interaction between the private sector and New York City OEM and um, its other partners in response uh, reach out and touch the private sector. 
Um, the third piece is looking at the regional aspect of it, which is a relatively, I think, a newer project, and I see some people in the room who, who've been involved with that, that initiative. Um, so to start off with the perspective from planning, I mean, what, we, what, what, what a plan means to me and what it means in OEM is that, you know, we're building these systems to respond and, and restore, and it's an, we're mainly a response plan to deal with the consequences of, a, of an emergency. Um, and I, and I, I want to stress systems because systems are, it's, it's not, some, some parts of them are rote protocol, but really it's about what is, what is that organization, what do the role and responsibilities look like, and, and who do you need to call and how do you call them to, to figure out a solution to the problem and, and define those objectives ahead of time too. Um, and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be exact, and, and we know that there's, you know, there's gonna be a lot of different um, pieces that affect what, what the response will look like and what the objectives are, but at least what it is is it's a system to respond. Um, the other piece is that it's really about relationship building too, and I know a lot of people talk about sort of the means, and, and so this is, you know, relationship building defines what the means are, understanding other players, what their limitations are, what their capabilities are, and, and, and kind of maybe break down some of the walls that, that have been created between, between agencies. Um, in addition to that, these, the systems also sort of build preset um, <clears throat> opportunities or coordinate incur to encourage relationships between people. Um, so we can't, in a city where there's a police department of 40,000 people and a fire department of, um, you know, probably about, about 6,000, 7,000 people, it, it's really, it may be pretty rare to have the same people on site, especially in a catastrophic event, and, and have them have that pre-relationship, get them all into a room and have them understand who they are. I think what it really is is sort of establishing that, those roles and responsibilities and, and sort of establishing what their relationship should be ahead of time. So that's, that's one other piece that the system does. Um, New York City local planning, um, as it relates to the private sector, there's a lot of items that we do where, where we t our plans that we work on, which is, you know, the transit strike, Amtrak, um, pan flu planning, and these are, these are all examples of, of planning efforts where it is, it's included what, you know, what the city will do, but it was also a heavy outreach to the private sector as it relates to information, their role in the EOC, what they may expect during the day of the event, um, and, and that, this is a lot of information sharing that happens through our external affairs division um, that has a private, public-private representative within there. Um, and then also that translates within, from the day-to-day -day into the EOC, which we have a private sector ESF who sits there and has, and pushes out information to the private sector. Um, and this is, this is sort of the, the current engagement model where we're looking at coordination between agencies and and the city or the, the public sector um, and, and reaching out to the private sector and saying, this is the information that we have. This is how it may affect your operations on a day-to-day. -day. And this is how you um, continue your operations. Um, but one of the things is that what, what I saw, at least with the um, pan flu planning that was happening in New York City, is that we actually had a um, we had a question that came down from the CDC, or it was one of the questions that was required by the grant. And this was really, how are you gonna ensure the uh, continuity of critical infrastructure and key assets during a pan flu event? Um, and I did a quick count, because, um, and I looked at the, at, at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is out of the Department of Commerce. They managed a lot of the sort of the information as it relates to um, you know, economic establishments within the New York City area. And that, that count is about, um, about 200,000 200, economic establishments. So that's a, that's a pretty big, big sizable uh, group, of, group of businesses that vary between sort of a small local business that runs a, runs a deli to, a, to large multinational corporations. And so the question that came out was, what does that engagement model look like? And, and so, you know, the CDC says, you know, here's, here's a couple million dollars, go figure out that problem or find some solutions to that problem. Um, but the complexity of that and, and the different economic sectors involved with that really presents a number of different types of solutions. And, 
and whether it's continuity, what, or what we saw and what was implemented was, one, um, a continuity of operations push and focus groups out to small businesses because they sometimes are not just your delis and, and places where you can get food um, or small restaurants, but they're also, they're also secondary and tertiary suppliers to the larger, um, larger multinational corporations as well as um, providing major, major support services to those organizations too. Um, so, th so I guess that sort of takes me to the next piece is because the question that came up is sort of what is the engagement model and how do you deal with the complexity between of, of, that, of that area? Um, because you know, in a way, if you go back to what, what we were talking about before is you talk about relationship building through planning and, and having those relationships up front with the private sector and being able to work with them, what, what we're really looking at is, is almost, if you take 200,000 establishments, how do you actually reach out to all of those, even, even with the umbrella organizations that are there and the number of economic sectors that are involved with this. Um, so it's sort of an issue where we can't really have that many friends um, in, in, our, in our Rolodex sometimes. So one of the pieces um, is, is sort of this um, regional planning effort which is the Regional Catastrophic Planning Grant Program, which came out um, in FY08, which was started in 2008. Um, and over the last year, we've been working with uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New York um, to develop a governance team for this. And this is 13 members that represent those four jurisdictions within those four states. And it runs from local representatives to New York City representatives to county representatives to state representatives, too. Um, and this covers a ground about 12,000 square miles and 22 million people. So the, the beauty of this program is that, and, and this I'll get to how it relates to uh, private sector, the private sector relationship, but the beauty of this program is that it, it really takes um, a whole region and, and the representatives of that region takes a federal grant program that crosses jurisdictional boundaries breaks down those boundaries and creates this 13 person team that sits and makes decisions about how the money's gonna be spent. And it's not, a, it's not an enormous amount of money, but it is what, what's, what's groundbreaking about it and, and the people that were involved with building this is that they, the 13 member council from New York and Connecticut will decide as to whether or not where that money should go and what projects would bet, best benefit the region. And so through this process, I think that a lot of those sort of jurisdictional boundaries have been have been broken down. And, and this is not a governance body in the sense that they're going to govern the region or issues um, associated with the region, but what they will do is it's a way to coordinate um, needs and requirements. So it's sort of like early formation of what the EU may have been um, in, as an economic community. So what the projects that, we, we, that, the, that the group has identified is sort of looking at regional infrastructure protection, taking a really close look at at one critical infrastructure piece, which is the energy sector, and really examining what, the, what its economic effects are on the region. Um, and that, that in, in a way, is a very clear look at how, how, um, how government is looking to help develop tools and information for the private sector and allow them to do their planning in, in response to that. Um, we also have some RAD, RAD programs, um, housing, EVAC, debris, logistics, um, and I mean, there's about nine projects, and I can go on and, and bore everybody with those nine projects, but really, one of the, one of the things that I, I really wanted to point out is that if you look at housing, logistics, and, and maybe sheltering, those are three areas of planning where we're really looking at a breakdown of, of, of economic activity, and that's a disruption of economic activity. You're looking at housing where people have lost their homes, They've lost durable goods. They've lost pieces or items that they normally would either consume or, or, or um, consume or actually replace over time, and 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 they're actually maybe hoping to replace their ho house um, logistics, where where the government is really looking towards the private sector for the resources that they need to respond. Things like food, water, um, blankets, cots. Um, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever commodities are needed to, to help 
life-sustaining commodities are needed, and also commodities that are needed to rebuild. Um, they're not, there aren't any, you know, I guess to echo a little bit what Marianne said, there aren't any real, the government doesn't run a Home Depot program. Like when, when you know, we're looking to rebuild, we're looking to Home Depot to buy, buy most of the stuff, or looking at some of the major um, developers, and that's, that's all within the private sector. And so I guess the question when that comes out with all those is what, is what does that engagement model look like? And it looks a lot different across the board. Um, it can look different by, by what we're talking about. If you're looking at housing and logistics, that's actually the creation of, the mo of a model, or of a, I mean, sorry, of a market, and, and, a, and a relatively enormous market. If you're looking at New Orleans, New Orleans, that's like $80 billion, I think, was allotted to go to New Orleans to help with the rebuild and the recovery. But if you look at the 22 million people that would be affected by this in the New York City area, that housing and logistics section would be enormous. We're looking at millions and millions of bottles of water and food that would need to come into the region, as well as all the resources that would be need to rebuild and repair a lot of the homes that would be damaged by any sort of large-scale natural disaster or even um, even a man-made disaster. So that's that's one of the things I think it, it's, it sort of reframes it. I'm, I'm, into instead of being sort of these problems that the public sector has into sort of the creation of a larger <clears throat> economic market due to a disruption, um, due to disruption or some damage to, to that area. Um, so, so what, is that, what does that look like? And, and that is the, one of the projects after the RCPG, um, the, the regional group looked at these plans and looked at what the consequences were, they actually made the, for the next round of, I guess, funding, looked at what, would, what does the private sector integration program look like? What does that look like for us? And one of the things I probably should have said earlier is that, you know, one of the, my perspective is, and I think a lot of the, the group who are on the RCPGP is that, is to tackle things very, by breaking things down into very discrete problems and not really trying to tackle everything all at once but find out what that discrete problem, what that discrete problem is, define the, the constraints of it, and define what, what an end solution would be and, and build that solution. Um, and so one of the things that came out after looking at these nine projects is really looking at the business operations center. And that's really looking at what is that, what does this business operations center look like? Um, what is its goal and responsibility? Who's, who's actually sitting in those seats? And, and it's really building that system to build those relationships or allow for that coordination and those relationships to happen um, between, I guess, looking at one thing, which would they be getting situational awareness in relation to COOP efforts so they can, they can continue their operations. And then the second side would be looking at sort of the other part, which would be how do I supply resources into this, um, into, to, to support the recovery and restoration or the response to a, a, um, a an event. And so, some of these models have been, have been sort of built out um, and, and there are a number of white papers on them and that's what, that's what we're sort of looking at to solve. I can't say we have any solutions, but I think we've seen one really great solution down in Florida where you see um, the logistics center that was built by a gentleman named Chuck Hagen down in Florida. He's the head of their logistics, statewide logistics. And what he did is he, instead of, because he needed all these commodities post-storm, he built these relationships and contracts with the, with, with the private sector and has the private sector sitting in, in with, that, with his team, his logistics team, to, to support and build and buy whatever they need to respond to these emergencies. And, and so the, it's, he sort of changed the paradigm where if you're looking at, he, he made FEMA not, not as, the, as, as one of the vendors versus amongst a large range of private sector vendors who they may have, they may have to go to. And um, so built that, built that system down there and allowed Florida to have a very robust commodity response to water and tarp response to, um, to an event. So, and with that said, I mean, I guess what we're still trying to do with this business operations center is we have an idea as to what it's gonna look like and what the goals are. I think the real important thing is what does that engagement model really look like in, in detail and who, who has the roles and responsibilities for that? How do we touch out to the different levels of, of, of businesses 
um, and, and manage that complexity. So that's, that's something that I think the region is moving forward toward to and uh, working to in the future. So. Thank you, James. Uh, and last, we'll hear from uh, Lori Hennenbell, Chief Security Officer, Prudential Insurance Company. Lori? Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Keevy, for having us all here today. I think this is a very important topic for all of us to share in. Um, being that I was with the public sector for 25 years and transitioned into private sector for the last three and a half, I have a fairly good understanding of, of both sides, and actually they're, all, they're not all that different. Uh, my responsibility in Prudential uh, handles not only the security for the associates and the assets for the company, but we also have business continuation and we have crisis management. So a lot of those same intersections of information that's necessary for the public sector to plan and prepare for, we do in the private sector as well. What we have a challenge with is once we take responsibility for all of our, our planning and preparedness, is how do we share that back out and how is that information used and how is it viable as a, a total strategy for the local levels in which we have operations, for the county levels as well as for the state levels. And then we have to bridge out to international because we're in uh, 32 countries in Prudential. So we from the Corporate Office of Global Security have responsible for not only here domestically, but also internationally. So we have a lot on our plate, and I have a very good team that works uh, very well uh, in all their relevant expertise to bring ideas and opportunities to the table for Prudential to then do some business modeling, do some crisis management modeling, and then share that with all of our partners. Um, that's a pretty daunting task, and I'm going to be like uh, John Pachikowski, and I didn't uh, burden you with my PowerPoint presentation of today, but I'll tell you this one page kind of summarized all the contacts that we in global security try to maintain on an ongoing basis, because we have to not only deal with just one town and just one state, but now we have to deal with many of them and we have to stand up uh, our security operations in each one of those locations to uh, work effectively with those partnerships. And, um, and I have to say that in most cases, um, the relationships, and I think that uh, that's probably the key word, the business relationships and working relationships we have are what's going to be the key factors if there is any type of emergency crisis and an opportunity for those um, uh, public and private sectors to come together is going to get us through it, um, hopefully with great resilience. Um, Private-public partnerships um, tend to um, fall a lot on Prudential. I, I have to tell you that we uh, encourage and we maintain those, and uh, not only for just Prudential, but we open our doors to work with our other business partners uh, in the community, whether it be the same um, uh, sector or whether it be other sectors that just happen to have operations that are close to us. And we also do that with the public sector. Uh, what we've also found, and maybe that's a little bit of my public sector coming into private sector, is that the opportunity isn't there all the time for even public sector to be able to come together in a forum like we have today and share information and knowledge. And we think that that's really important and we are good corporate citizens in many respects and that's one of them. Um, I know that it was mentioned before that there was a terrorist plot that was found uh, to be um, uh, an imminent plot against Prudential, against our corporate headquarters in Newark. And I have to tell you that resonated very quickly within Prudential. I was on the public sector side at that time. I was not in, in Prudential. But I would tell you that opportunity, I will call it, for not only Prudential but for other private sector entities to have a plot that was discovered, a very intense business plan, white paper, I would stand it up against any business operations you were trying to put up. And um, it was actually to take down uh, our building and cause very strong disruption not only for the state of New Jersey but it was really to resonate throughout the financial markets. And um, that's real and that uh, event, an opportunity for us as a company to learn from that and then share that information with other companies to know what to prepare for and against. So we have even a greater risk. It's not just about the emergency from a natural disaster, but we know and we take very seriously the fact that we were actually a target. And we know those don't go away. And if they've expended enough resources to have uh, um, some uh, actual physical resources that were operatives outside of our building uh, gathering information and data over at least a six-month period of time that we could actually um, account for, then we know that they meant business. 
And um, we were able to uh, mitigate some of that same theory and strategy that they had put in the plan to uh, launch the attack against us. And now we have better security as a result of that, more robust security, and probably some better partner partnerships with our, our public uh, sector entities. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. We take very seriously a uh, health crisis. And we have a very robust plan that we do with, within. So not only to, to help and assist our employees and our associates that work with us, but also, again, in being good corporate citizens and working along with the public health authorities in offering any resources, including we have uh, medical staff that we offer the resources of. Uh, so if there's any points of distribution or any other activities that would be necessary, um, again, operating in 32 different countries, we can offer a lot of resources to that. Um, I wanted to bring up a little bit about the impact of um, any situation that causes disruption. I know that um, transportation has been mentioned a bit today. Um, I know, I was very glad to hear, Marianne, you brought up the CEAS program, which um, we have operations in both New York and in, in uh, Philadelphia, and we uh, do support the CEAS program. We are registered with, within those two entities, and that's one of the things that I will say is um, a a bit of a concern in, in many of our operations is how do we, if we are good corporate citizens and want to give back and want to make sure that we are part of that resilience plan, how do we get our folks back into, our key, our critical employees back into areas, and how do we work with those uh, agencies in order to do that? And, and we try to think of it as we want to do that ahead of time, which is what the CEASE program provides us. We have an opportunity to register our folks, and then they're card carrier members, so we know that our critical IT folks, or whatever, whoever we have to get in from a, a building operations perspective, we can get them in uh, when it is safe to do so, working with and collaboratively with, uh, collaboratively with all of our public sector partners. Um, that also brings to the point of just that information sharing um, before the chaos. And I think that um, by having a good, solid program like CEASE, you can do that. I think you take out a lot of the things you scramble to produce at the time of an emergency um, by preparing and sharing and making sure that those um, registrations of our critical employees are maintained. And we acknowledge that we have to communicate with the public sector in order to make sure that that happens. Um, within Prudential, because communication and information is key, we uh, have developed a very good analysis component within our operations, which is a little different than the model that we'd had um, probably a few years ago. And what we found is by having uh, key information that can be shared with the appropriate associates within our organizations, again, in those operations of 32 countries, um, that better prepares them. Because we have a robust business continuation plan and crisis management program, um, the more, more information we can get to our folks ahead of time, just like in the public sector, uh, the better we're going to be able to um, prepare and mitigate any type of hazard that might come our way. For an example, uh, this week we were dealing with the G20. And we do have operations that were housed right within the vicinity of most of the large protests. And that impact to us is just to make sure that from a global security perspective, our associates are, are safe and secure, but also that our business operations can continue. So we're able to almost seamlessly give the business groups information in London so that if they had to turn the switch and operate from a different location, they could do that, and they were ready to do that. It wasn't that all of a sudden the protests were there, and now it became a point that they could no longer work in that environment and then would have to scramble to set up operations someplace else. So by, again, that window of opportunity of knowing things and sharing information ahead of time, or even, again, we take that responsibility in Prudential, and we stand up the resources to look at and analyze through many different sources, I will tell you. We make sure that we have some that we actually pay for, that we um, are tapped into. We have some that bring, because of our expertise on our global security staff, uh, those uh, resources, of course, and connectivity and relationships that they brought from their, their prior employment are, are very important to us because we don't know where that's going to come from. And then again, right down to the media, because we know the media is very robust and can information share very quickly. 
But part of the issue that we try to do in, in our prudential global security entity is try to get out in front of that media report because we found, just like in the public sector, we found that sometimes as the media reports something, it might not be exactly what's going on. And then now you're dealing with that um, rumor and or hysteria that might be uh, resonating in a particular group that now you have to try to mitigate on top of whatever response that you have to give. We host regular meetings at our Prudential sites with um, all different business groups and, and uh, public sector members, and we offer that opportunity even for, again, as I mentioned, our business partnering model of them to even host their own meetings right within our facilities, because that's one thing. As a financial institution, we don't have a lot of resources like a Home Depot or a Walmart to give in an event of emergency, but we can be there in the event that you need to do proper planning or preparation, or you just need that spot where you're bringing those groups together, and, and as we look at it, a regional approach on, on the public sector side, a lot of times you wouldn't have that capability um, or resource, so that's where we try to bridge that gap. We participate actively in um, any exercises that come our way, so make sure if you have anything in the works and, and any planning of an exercise that uh, we certainly are willing to participate. Um, of course, within reason. We uh, understand the need for testing and exercising. We do that, I would say, weekly with our business continuation groups. And uh, we've been very active even in pandemic preparedness. And even to the point of this year, uh, probably going into a, a multi-day test uh, within Prudential to see how we can be resilient during a, a health crisis. Uh, what else was brought up today, and, and um, Governor Kane had started with it, and, and then the first panel was, was talking about cybersecurity and, and IT and infrastructure. And that's really critical to us as well. We fight the demons of the privacy, so identity theft, because we are a financial institution, has a lot of uh, important private information on individuals. Um, we are very guarded against that. And uh, we have a very robust uh, um, capability within all of our data centers as well as um, making sure that backup occurs and that resiliency is there. And it's very extensive to do that. But it is also a concern of Prudential that um, all the IT infrastructure could be impacted. And what would that mean for our business continuation entities? And it's a difficult um, balance to make sure that you have enough of that security and awareness about the cyber or potential cyber attacks that are out there and how the response is. And it's a bit more difficult to test that uh, than it would be for other phys physical security uh, impacts that we might have. I think that uh, the most important thing that we can gather out of a meeting like this, or even as we, we take back what we've listened to today, is the, the fact that I think everybody is willing to be collaborative. And I think sometimes it's a matter of carving out enough time and having that ability to carve out the time to build on the relationships and collaborative events that are ongoing. And sometimes we forget that. And sometimes we get caught up in that daily operation that we don't spend that time to have that relationship and, and in a public, private sector um, growth and strategy uh, to come together, I think that that should be almost a mandate. And to have good, strong organizations on a regional approach, as we've heard uh, previously today, that incorporate that private sector um, at the table. Because to hear that, um, oh, you know, I can get information out to 9,000 of my employees within the state of New Jersey um, within a matter of minutes because we have that capability, whether it be through our uh, intranet sites, whether it be through our notifying systems, whether it be f um, through just our building operations if those uh, systems are impacted. And we can even uh, have that call tree go to personal residences. So for us, we can be a great resource, right down to even a, a minimal uh, impact of let's say there's a significant accident on the New Jersey Turnpike. So right here in the state of New Jersey, given that we have the capability of contacting all those employees with, within our reach, we can mitigate that traffic disaster that's going to occur if we push all those people out to one roadway um, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So those type of things that we continue to build on and work with and have an understanding um, I think only helps in the total operation and support that we as a, a private sector um, operation can give to the public sector. Um, the last thing I wanted to, to speak about is um, really the 
the need that public sector has from private sector. Um, I'm sure I can tell you from my experience in Prudential, you, you wouldn't want to, as a public sector member, come in and, and try to even remotely uh, understand our business continuation plans because they are so robust and very detail-oriented. But what you would want to know is exactly what you had talked about, Marianne, and I think that that is what is our plan outside of our four walls of our buildings? What is our plan if we have to mobilize people out of an area? And you know what? I have to tell you that I really have not had those conversations with anybody in the public sector. And um, as I sat here today, I thought, how am I going to build that relationship with the folks that need to understand our plans, because we have them on where we're going to put people, but you know what, I don't know collectively, as have all those dots been connected, and not only from right within our North Campus or our Woodbridge Campus or Roseland, but how is that resonating out to the county perspective, and then how does that feed into the state's evacuation process? And that is a critical need for whether it be a man-made disaster or whether it be a natural disaster. And I think that's the takeaway that I, I'm going to have, is to try to figure out how we can bring those groups together to understand not only here in the state of New Jersey, but then how do I do that um, throughout all of our locations of Prudential uh, throughout the world. And that's, um, that's a daunting task. But I think it's a necessary one, because I think that once we take responsibility, which we have in Prudential, to take care of our own house, I call it, and our own buildings and our operations, but now as we move that buffer zone out, we move that circle out, how am I impacting um, other folks and how are we going to resolve and try to uh, ensure that all the proper strategies are in place and we understand what those are and they're communicated well. Uh, and do that before the chaos and the crisis. We want to do that way ahead of time and we want to have those, uh, those plans and that information at the ready and have, have the, the backing of um, our own senior management team to, to implement that. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lori. I just have um, one thing that I'd like the panel to, uh, to react to, and then I'll open it up to, uh, to questions from the floor. Uh, and this, this sort of relates to the way Lori ended this up. Uh, my question, my, my comments to the panel I'd like to, to react to is, is this. Is, is the current public sector model the right model? Let me say that again. Is the current public sector model the right model? Is the role of the private sector to support the public sector, or is the public sector's role to support the private sector in response to recovery and intelligence gathering? If you take a look at the, um, the private sector, as the figures are, are always quoted, that there's 75 to 85 percent of the critical infrastructure and key resources are, are owned and operated by the private sector, um, does it make sense to build capacity in the private sector, especially in their supply and value chains, to respond because they're going to be the true first responders. So I'd like, I'd like a reaction. Lori, I'll start with you. I think it's a, a mixture, I will tell you. I think it's both. I think that we as private sector entities have a responsibility to our corporations and to our associates that we maintain good operations and, and planning and process. And I think that that should be something that, that we do hold responsibility for. However, I do uh, submit that in a way the public sector has to maintain that as well because they have to have an understanding of that. And I believe that the public sector, because once I get outside my four walls of, of any of our buildings, then we go into that public sector domain. And how, and how does that interface and interaction uh, occur? And um, at what level of responsibility do we have a comfort that we're going to be able to have a plan that's successful and a procedure that's successful? And I think I'm not comfortable that I have that right now, um, that understanding, and I don't believe that they exist um, throughout all of the operations that Prudential holds. I think we're making great strides in that area, but I think we have a lot more uh, work to do in that. And many of that, it, many of the opportunity to do that is through relationship building. The standards that um, are talked about and some are, are implemented from the government side does help regulate, if 
that's not the right word, regulate what the private sector is mandated to do. And I think that that is helpful in a certain <coughs> respect, but a lot of that comes down to the bricks and mortar and not the operation. Area. Um, well, I'll start by saying that uh, in an emergency, we are all on the sinking ship together. And it's important that uh, both the private sector and the public sector be equally prepared. You cannot have a completely prepared public sector and a totally unprepared private sector, and vice versa. You can't have a completely prepared private sector and an unprepared or lack of preparedness on the public sector side. They feed off of each other. And it, once again, it goes back to this, what I was talking about before, about integration. It's, it, it's important that at every step of the process, from prevention to developing plans, to responding, training and exercising, uh, that you have kind of you're walking down this road together. And uh, through that, you're, you're building the relationships. I think you're developing how uh, the different parts of that system will work together. I think you're looking at what the needs are on both sides, how those needs can be accommodated. And I think you're also coming to terms with what you just have to agree to disagree on. There are going to be things that just the public sector cannot do. There's going to be things that the private sector just cannot do. But understanding that in advance can allow you to adapt to the situation when an emergency occurs. But once again, I think, I think the model has to be an integrated collaborative model or, or it will fail during an emergency. Um, well, I guess there, there, there are a couple things. One, with I think the, you know, the, the public sector has a responsibility to the private sector to provide them with, with information that's actionable information that the, public, uh, the private sector can take and, and implement their continuity of operations plans. That's, I mean, in, 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 in a nutshell, I think that is, that is possibly one of the most important responsibilities that the, private, the public sector has to the private sector. And I think it's also important for them to, you know, for the private sector, the public sector to push out information and also define what the unknown information is too, and either pre-event or during the event. And I think because a lot of people, a lot of the decisions that are made are, are into uncertainty, and so that makes it a little bit, you know, if people understand the, the scope of what available information is out there, I think it makes, a, makes it a little bit easier to, to make decisions moving forward. And I think... I think maybe sometimes that's not communicated as well as that thinking that the public sector may know that there is this gap of information between the public sector or the private sector. Um, but that's, 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 you know, just sharing information and situational awareness is, is key. Um, the other part is we're really sort of where the private sector gives, provides resources and support to, to an event. And um, I think, you know, the private sector is, we have a program called Palms, which is the private sector, um, it's basically a way of cataloging uh, donations from the private sector pre-event or what they can do or what skills and assets they may have to help support the event. That's, 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 that's one piece of it, which is the management of donations and volunteers. Uh, Mike, can I jump in here because we're running short okay, on time? Turn it over to the audience. Go to the audience. I know Dr. Redlander wants to make this. Then the other side is really looking at sort of defining what that market looks like and what the commodities are needed, what the commodities are needed in a way post-event to the private sector and, to, and from, from the government side. And sort of what does that housing project look like? Like what does housing recovery look like? What's needed? What kind of information is needed? What kind of resources are needed? And how, how you actually access that market. In a way, it's really looking at defining the games. If the, if the, if the situation has changed and the market is I guess that, that, that economic market has changed if you talk about New Orleans and the rules of the game have changed and that needs to be, the government has a responsibility to really, um, I guess, define what that entry point is, how you, what the rules of the game are and, and how big that resource need is. So that's all. Uh, Erwin Redliner, I, I, I recognize obviously the extraordinary necessity for understanding what the private sector brings to the table and it's quite a lot. In some cases it's much more than the government has at its uh, fingertips. On the other hand, uh, people elect public officials to take responsibility for disasters. It's uh, a formula for absolute chaos uh, not to be very clear that the public sector is responsible for responding especially to large scale disasters. Uh, it's a question of capacity, it's a question of responsibility, it's a question of authority. And, and I think that, uh, you know, just to give an example, in New Orleans or in Louisiana, the Gulf Coast, 250,000 houses were destroyed. And total to date, 
Habitat and all the other private NGO uh, uh, organizations have provided about 900 out of a denominator of 250,000. So to fantasize about the private sector's role in accomplishing what's clearly a public sector responsibility in a large-scale disaster is, is not uh, helpful. Second of all, I haven't really heard mention of the NGOs and the role of the Red Cross as a sector and other organizations like that, and the role of citizens, in fact, because it's not just private businesses and government. It's actually what level of, of citizen readiness is there and how does that uh, add to the uh, capacity to be resilient uh, with respect to big disasters. And clearly, the organizations like Red Cross have a major role to play. And one of the things the private sector needs to do is to be uh, part of that whole mix that includes the NGOs, citizens, protecting business continuity, of course, but all falling under some, hopefully, organized mantle and umbrella of readiness that is managed by those who are supposed to manage it, which is the public sector. Well, I, I can start. Uh, maybe if Marianne or Lori want to make an observation. I mean, I think, I, I think Dr. Redliner, the first thing is that um, the, the way that this panel was set up was to confine our comments to kind of private sector integration. I agree with you that um, the, the NGOs, the nonprofit sector plays a very critical role. However, that, that, I think that was not the vein in which uh, many of our comments were constructed. I think we could spend a whole other panel discussing the vital role that a variety of nonprofits, the Red Cross, faith-based organizations play in disaster response. I agree. I think the government has to be the driver, the, the creator of the construct and the framework in which preparedness occurs both at the local, state, and federal levels. I think we create basically the environment in which parties can come together and have a facilitated discussion about what plans need to be in place, how those plans can be organized, how various systems can be established to respond. That is the role of government, to provide that kind of that forum for that dialogue to occur, that construct. In some sense, we can drive the process in terms of saying, we are going to work on this versus that, or we're going to focus on A, a or B. However, I think it's, it's important to understand, and I'm sure you, you can understand this as well, the economic constraints that both the private sector, the public sector, and the nonprofit sector have in terms of developing preparedness plans. And it's by combining the resources of all of those entities under this construct of government, because yes, I agree that response, recovery, preparedness is ultimately a governmental responsibility. However, we cannot carry the water alone. That, there has to be a partnership in that. And I think that was kind of the vein, at least of my, of my comments on this. And I would add the communication to that can be facilitated very easily through private sector's role as well. So even from the big picture perspective of that information being shared, then we can also be an arm to reinforce it. And I think that that would be very important. And because most corporations have that good corporate citizen model, then we certainly embrace any of those measures that we can do that to be that partner and get that information now. Because if you're prepared at work, we're hoping to prepare everybody at home. And we, we try to do that even within Prudential. We have both from a home perspective for our associates as well as in the workplace. Hi, uh, Rich Eastman from the Morris County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I had questions originally back with the other panel, and now I have more of a comment. Uh, we have been working with uh, Morris County Office of Emergency Management uh, and the rest of the law and public safety uh, uh, department at Mars County and also with the New Jersey State Police. And being the umbrella organization like you have spoken about uh, for the private sector. Uh, we include members uh, of the chamber but also all other uh, businesses. As we started out in um, Right after 9-11, uh, being focused more on business continuity, awareness, and that kind of uh, perspective with the businesses. And we have uh, evolved into uh, being a participant in a database that the New Jersey State Police has put together, a resource directory database, which is simply a directory where we have gotten uh, a number of businesses as a pilot to participate in with resources that they would have available in the event of an emergency. These may be resources that are specific to a sector, uh, like hotels, rooms, uh, food, and that kind of thing, or they may be uh, resources that they have available uh, in generic office space uh, translators. 
Okay, I, I will in a real, uh, okay. The resource directory database, though, is what I think you folks are talking about uh, in that we're, we as a community, and this is being rolled out to the rest of the counties as an example, and I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Uh, Murray Turoff and GIT. Uh, Lori, there are actual signs in Newark leading you to evacuation routes when you're driving. They send you to 280, and after you get on 280, there's nothing else. That's correct. So there's some lack between agencies in the city, the county, Morris County, where you would end up, uh, you know, in any exchange, uh, which really brings us to the heart of the problem, and they demonstrated in Katrina and other places, uh, that to react to emergencies, there's a whole theory, our chap from the Coast Guard talked about Swiss cheese theory, but it's part of high reliability organizations theory, and that says you've got to constantly expose problems and errors and get together with all the parties that are mutually related in different agencies, government, private, whatever, expose those and try to solve them before they develop into a major one. And we don't do that because we don't, as academics we can't get it, you people don't get, get together from private to government to expose your errors to one another because you're afraid of what might leak out or whatever. But it has to be done if we're gonna have resilient systems. Okay, um, I actually have a question for you. It's about the, uh, the cease and the, the, the cease and the BNET pro, uh, program. Um, I was a card carrying member with a Fortune 500 company for about three years. I'm not gonna name the name of the company because I don't want anything thrown at me. Um, outside of that though, the, the program is effective when you sit in a meeting like this and talk about it. Where it's not really effective is when you show the BNET, the cease card or the BNET program to the officer that's standing on the checkpoint that you're trying to get through, because we did it quite a few times um, in New York City, um, also in New Jersey where we had offices. Um, so I wanted to know what the governmental organizations are doing to actually push the cease program out to the field so that private sector can do what they're supposed to under that program. Um, actually, that's funny because I, was, I just came out of a meeting out of, on that a couple of days ago. Um, and, and we're basically working on a, on a protocol. I think the first challenge was to really get it accepted and, and get that process at the decision maker level. And I think the next step is really to go down and start training it and, and build the very specific protocols and, and steps that need to happen to allow people with those cards to get into, into, those, into those areas. And I think a lot of this will hopefully involve the Port Authority too because if you're looking at New Jersey and New York City and, and making that cross crossing, the Port Authorities are a pretty vital um, partner in that piece too. In the um, and I'll just add that I agree with you, and it's very difficult, especially in the state of New Jersey, where you have, I believe, 567 different municipalities as well as county and state government. Is um, they don't have cease here that I know of at this time in the state of New Jersey. So if I have employees that live in the state of New Jersey that have to be mobilized into New York or have to go into Philadelphia and there are checkpoints in the state of New Jersey, how do I get them? Um, I also you know, caution all of the employees that are the card carrying members that if they are stopped at a checkpoint and not, are, are not allowed to go further, do not cause an altercation to say that, you know, yes, this is going to get me in, that you have to obey whatever the um, official, public official that's there, whether it be fire, police, or emergency services. Um, so it, it is difficult, but at least it's something. I will tell you, um, in Essex County, I do have a, um, an agreement with the Sheriff's Department there, and I have a letter for my critical employees, but most of them don't live in Essex County, so how do I get them even to, to get into Essex County? So it is an issue. I know that um, in the state, um, they've been looking at it. I know, um, as you just heard, that yes, in New York City, they're still looking at it, and there was, that was the first um, uh, group that we actually joined the CEAS program and BNIP program through New York City, and they've been doing it for a bit of time. So it, it does take time, but at least it's there. There is a mechanism for which that can happen. Is that it? That's okay. Okay. I thank, I thank all the panelists. Oh.